For those who play games with a competitive environment, there's a word we hear frequently brought up, the metagame. This term brings with it many misunderstandings, questions, and emotions, all of which deserve a closer look, especially for those wanting to learn about or get involved with a competitive game. So what exactly is a metagame? Let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5, Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. When I started taking Yu-Gi-Oh! seriously in high school, I distinctly remember my first tournament experience. I took my deck, which I thought was not especially powerful, but competent, to a local game store with three of my friends. I paid my entry fee, played five rounds, and my baby raccoon deck and I got utterly thrashed. Turns out, my strategy wasn't anywhere near as good as I had thought, although I still had an absolute blast. While in between rounds, however, I heard rumblings from my friends of incredibly powerful decks that I didn't get the chance to face. Back in 2014, these decks were Burning Abyss, Necroz, and Shadal. And I was almost thankful I didn't have to square off against their monumental might with my dinky deck. These decks, these strategies, were the metagame. So what exactly is the metagame, or meta for short? The metagame can be defined as a small group of the most competent and popular strategies in a competitive game. These can be anything from the most utilized champions or team configurations in League of Legends, to the most common Smash Bros Ultimate Fighters, to the highest placing decks in Yu-Gi-Oh or some formats of Magic the Gathering. There usually aren't more than five really common options, and often players utilize tier lists to better describe the strategies that fan out beneath the primary metagame. In the current Yu-Gi-Oh format, for example, the meta, or tier 1 decks, are Orcist, Sky Striker, and Salamangrate, based on tournament representation and top 32 placement at a variety of high caliber events. Below them we can see still powerful but less prominent options such as Thunder Dragon, Pendulum, and True Draco that can be described as tier 2, and below them are far more rogue decks which can still sneak in a win. Through repeated results, the top strategies become evident to us. But this is one small piece of a larger system in constant repetition. This meta cycle can be broken down into five steps, which explain how a metagame develops. In the first step, new content is introduced. New content can be a variety of things. For one, the game itself can start this cycle if it's new, but beyond that, any updates to rulings, ban lists, or new playable options via product releases or patches can trigger the cycle to start. For example, each new fighter introduced in Super Smash Bros. counts as new content, which can potentially have an impact on the metagame. Joker from Persona 5 has become a powerful contender since his release due to high speed of movement and attack, as well as some devastating combo potential. In Yu-Gi-Oh! meanwhile, the release of Dark Neostorm last April introduced new cards for the Orcist theme, Dingirsu, the Orcist of the Evening Star, and Orcus Crescendo, which moved it from a solid tier 2 contender to a prominent tier 1 threat, where it has remained despite a variety of indirect hits over the past several months. The second step sees experimentation with this new content, as players test the release for competitive viability. The goal is to determine if the new content is strong enough to stand on its own, if it slots well into existing strategies to enhance their strength, or if it simply isn't going to have an impact on the metagame. With the Orcus deck I mentioned previously, for example, Gizmek Orochi, the Serpentron Sky Slasher, was inaugurated into the deck after its release in August's Rising Rampage set. While decent on its own, it slots incredibly well into the Orcus archetype due to its type being a machine, attribute being dark, and ability to summon itself on the opponent's turn. Meanwhile, the rest of the set proved to be fairly lacking in competitive viability. The third step is fairly straightforward. Due to time and experimentation, the metagame solidifies. The top strategies become known, and players can walk into a tournament knowing what to expect in many of their games and matches. 
In the fourth step, as a result of this solidification, counters for common threats develop, and new strategies are tested with the intent of felling an open niche in the format or solving a particular problem a player is facing. For example, early in the Pokémon Sword and Shield competitive landscape, Dracovish arose as a powerful water type capable of smashing through many bulky Pokémon with its signature move, Fish's Rend. As a result of this powerful water Pokémon's rise to power, Gastrodon was introduced to this format as a counter. Its signature ability, Storm Drain, draws all water type attacks to it, negates their damage, and raises its special attack by one stage. This ability, combined with its bulk, made Gastrodon a perfect counter for Dracovish. Similarly in Yu-Gi-Oh, we can see the rise of Grand Maju de Eza decks during late August and September, getting first and second place respectively at YCS Niagara and Portland as a counter to a variety of powerful decks that sought to go first and establish control of the game, such as Orcus, Skystriker, and Salamangrate, three top decks in the meta. The amount of removal at the deck's disposal and its ability to land a single, massive blow to end the game immediately made it a powerful option and counter for breaking through these boards. The fifth and final step is a continuation of the fourth. The meta adapts to the counters that develop and either strategies drop off, making the counters useless, or a way to patch up or play around the problems is found. Dracovish, for example, fell off in use significantly after Gastrodon rose to counter it. These last two steps continue until the cycle begins anew with the introduction of more content. In Gastrodon's case, it may drop off now that Dracovish is no longer in the meta leaving an opening for Dracovish to come back, and then Gastrodon returns as well, over and over and over again. Just like the cyclical nature of the metagame, metagames themselves are an inevitability. There's no way to prevent them from forming, which is something not every player is thrilled with. Metagames, after all, are not without their downsides. For one, playing against the same strategies over and over again can be not only boring, but frustrating if the strategy is highly effective. These sorts of powerful characters, decks, and builds can lead to lesser strategies and less experienced players having frequent losses. The losses can spawn a second downside, the divide between casual and competitive players, as they polarize along the name-calling lines of filthy casuals and meta sheep. Some meta players feel the casual audience is unskilled and doesn't want to improve or play better strategies, using any excuse possible to avoid it. Some casual players, meanwhile, consider themselves to be paragons of unique development, spurring the competitive players for conforming and copying others who are winning to the letter, rather than coming up with their own ideas or playing unorthodox strategies. While these are often exaggerations, there are enough players in each camp to call this a problem with the existence of the meta. A third disadvantage is the balance the meta strategies can sometimes disrupt. These options are successful for a reason. They were often created to be leaps and bounds above the other choices at a player's disposal. In other words, meta strategies are designed to be more powerful. Sometimes, however, these strategies can be too powerful, too overtuned, resulting in broken or stagnant formats where the top options stay consistent and instill further outrage among the player base at how unfair the strategies are. No one wants to sit through a format where 85% of the top placing players are on the same strategy, at every tournament, for months at a time. Yu-Gi-Oh had this in late 2018 with the release of Spiral Double Helix, which brought the Spiral deck to the top of the charts and metagame dominance for several months, even with immediate banlist hits to try and curb its power. And finally, an issue more specific to games where we need to pay for the strategies, such as trading card games where buying individual cards is necessary, is that meta options are often expensive. Highly effective cards and options are often printed in high rarities, meaning there are fewer copies available for the player base to use. As a result of this scarcity and demand, prices rise, and only those with the capital to spend can have these highly effective options, which can create further divides between those who can afford it and those who can't, often falling along those casual and competitive lines we talked about earlier. Despite the disadvantages, however, there are still a variety of benefits that the existence of metagames creates. Firstly, metagames help players prioritize information. The metagame is often comprised of only a few top strategies, and as a result, this lowers the barrier to competitive entry players might otherwise experience. It's a lot easier to show up to a tournament 
and only have to remember the intricacies of three or four top options, which will get you through a large portion of the tournament day, especially for people with busy lives who don't always have time to spend on their games. Secondly, this limited pool of meta strategies means that it's possible to have more skillful games and learn and grow as a player in your chosen hobby. When players get into a mirror match, a game where both players are piloting the same strategy, both players seriously test their skills and have the opportunity to learn from one another. It becomes a battle to see who understands the intricacies of their choice better, has a firmer grasp on principles of play like tempo and advantage, and can navigate the game's mechanics more effectively. Additionally, by playing the same strategy as a pro, it's possible to watch them and learn from what they do, then apply those lessons to other strategies and the game as a whole. Those learning experiences contribute to a third benefit of metagames, the ability to play off-meta. In order for a player to succeed with a rogue or off-meta choice, they need to have a thorough understanding of the game and how top strategies work, then analyze other available options to find an effective counter. Even without playing the popular strategies in a metagame, by watching them and what they do, their high density in tournament settings allows players to design or choose a rogue strategy that will take them to the top. These are the underdog stories we love so much, and they wouldn't be possible without a favorite to be pitted up against. While there are benefits and disadvantages to the existence of the metagame, its existence is guaranteed so long as a game is competitive in nature. Even then, the meta can be used to describe the most effective and efficient options in any game. The most effective crop production methods in a farming simulator, the shortest path to completing a single player adventure game, and the most powerful weapons and upgrades for speeding up the process. Even the most optimal word choices and letters in Scrabble for getting a ton of points. There are always going to be better and best options. And next time, we're going to talk about what components create these powerful options for players. But until then, thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? Did you learn something about what metas are and how they come to be as a player or as a game designer? And if you play competitive games already, what are your thoughts on meta strategies? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep this discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation and you want to hear more from me, subscribe and dingling that notification bell so you never miss an update. I'm putting out new videos every other week on games and gaming mechanics, and dropping a like lets me know you want to see more. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Draw5Move5, it's the best way to stay up to date with the channel and get hyped for new videos. My name is Gabe, this is Draw5Move5, and until next time, go have a good game.